Okay, so once again for Alicia. Uh, and Martin, uh, Martin Kiefer, the curator of the Contemporary Art Department at MOVE. Oh. Uh, the guiding tour will be done in, in English, so please. Thank you very much. Hello everybody, I see that we are not a small group, we have a very big group, so I hope um, you can hear us. We try to be uh, quite short for each gallery because we have three floors to see together. Uh, we wanted initially that you can ask questions, but as you are so many, perhaps it's a bit difficult. But we are two persons, so perhaps sometimes you can grab one of us who is not speaking. Um, so we are very happy and uh, proud to be uh, curators of this uh, very important show, we think, because it's a uh, Ukrainian show in Ukraine, in Kiev, of uh, two shows that we are under the title of Forbidden Image, uh, presenting Boris Mikhailov on these two floors, and on the last floor, the Ukrainian uh, Crossing Line exhibition, which is about the Kharkiv School of Photography. So which of course has a big importance because it's something that is coming from you and also of course Mikhailov is like, we can say, one of the first major solo exhibition in Ukraine itself. So it has a, of course, a kind of strong symbolic character in plus. We want to say in advance that the show is created by three persons. The third person missing is of course Björn Geldof that you might know from the Peter Gods and himself, the director and that we are three foreigners. There are no Ukrainian specialists of photography and Boris Mikhailov today present. We never were uh, the three of us during the two years we were working together. And I think it's also a kind of advantage because uh, we give uh, from different backgrounds other inputs. Uh, I'm Swiss, Alicia is French, Jörg <coughs> is Belgium. So we have a kind of Western European um, image and interpretation of what you will see. So it's not something which is completely 100% historically representing perhaps like you would expect for each artist. It's like a curatorial, personal, subjective choice of us, the curators, with, of course, trying to put this into a, uh, in context. So we have different themes. Do you want to come over to explain about the yeah, Subjects. so it, 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 the overall project is, so I'm, I'm also very happy and honored and intimidated to be surrounded by so many people, so many young people, uh, because us being museum curators in a big city like Paris and big, big, big museums, we're not so used to having such a, an impact on people. And uh, I must say it's extremely beautiful to, to witness that, and I think the picture is is an incredible place for that reason, being a place which is free, which attracts so many, uh, such a beautiful crowd of young people, and uh, where people are able to come and come. Because for us, uh, it's a different experience of the museum, and it gives me hope personally about, about the future of museums, uh, because I think it's a place where people come and come and come back, and can also chill. Anyhow, that was just an introduction point, because it's also, why we're here is also as outsiders, as Martin said, uh, and it helps us reflect on overall problems in, in general, also about institutional models. So I'm now competing with Pink Floyd, so it's a little <laughs> bit difficult. Um, but the overall uh, project and title of the, of the, of the show is The Forbidden Image. So for us, what we wanted to challenge was to, th to think about provocation and how uh, Boris Mikhailov and also the Kharkiv School of Photography were pushing the boundaries of the image. Uh, so again, it, even though it's the first kind of the first ambitious retrospectives of, uh, of Boris Mikhailov in Ukraine, it is still kind of a thematic uh, and, and orientated uh, proposal. Um, so regarding this idea of the forbidden image and trying to understand how Boris was always pushing the boundaries of the image of what we are um, able to see and what we are allowed to see in society, for example, uh, we want we had enhanced different themes. So uh, the first theme was, and, and that's where we are, is the idea of reality um, and how Boris, in a way, even when he was capturing the real, was already kind of showing us something that is maybe drunk with life, which is over the top 
which is a reality that is uh, kind of overloaded with with its own self, um, and and that's where we, we and that's where we started, and that's also where Boris wanted to start. Being uh, and I, I'm sure that he, you know how he is. He's not someone who he's always very provocative, even in the way he talks about his images. But I think that the idea of starting the show within this idea of the real, with those very iconic series of Soul Play and of Sots Art and Luriki was also in Ukraine to start from this Soviet reality that of course he captured and also challenged uh, throughout his uh, practice. The other themes that we wanted to enhance, and again, we're, I'm going back to the point Martin uh, made at the beginning, the idea that we're not specialists of photography, nor of voice, nor of Ukrainian art, that we're foreigners, we're outsiders. So, uh, But the, it allowed us, in a way, to stress, I think, something in, in Boris' practice, and also uh, then we will see in the Harkis School of Photography, of uh, him being not only an, an, a photographer, but also a performer, and also some kind of a conceptual artist. So that's really something that we, we wanted to enhance. So beyond the reality, which is the first theme, this idea that Boris kind of defines a new type of humanism, um, which is kind of a life drug humanism, uh, there is something about the performative that we wanted to stress and the way he also dealt with nudity, which was also very, very provocative and the idea again of the forbidden image. And uh, the other thing was, um, the idea of, con of the conceptual. And then we will see that we're always flowing between those different themes. Uh, and uh, yeah. And to start with these galleries, so I'm speaking about starting from this, the idea of framing Soviet reality, and that's where we are. In, this, in the next room, there is something about diving into the process of boys dealing with images. Uh, it's, it's a piece called Diary. And this diary is this kind of ongoing archive that boys uh, creates and uh, and images are adding every day and it's something that he keeps very secret it's kind of the matrix of his thinking about images and it's something that we cannot approach so easily so it's really something it was almost a performance to watch him gather the images in in the room maybe you can speak about <laughs> yes. yesterday's sandwich what is good with his first floor here on the third floor is that we have the three things in the three gatherings so it's like a resume of the show that you see on the fourth and the fifth floor uh, afterwards. It's like the entrance to get directly into these themes. As Alicia said, we are the new uh, humanism here, and we have the very beautiful Pink Floyd music installation called Yesterday's Sandwich, which is more like the personal romantics, another theme. And the third theme, which is the nude and the performative. These are our three approaches, how we have chosen series, how we have chosen uh, for Kharkiv artists, um, different galleries with uh, different themes. So on this level, you have all the three elements. Yesterday's Sandwich is a beautiful theory, uh, something, you know, Boris is not always comfortable with, with a beautiful image, because um, he is a very funny photographer. He has a lot of humor. He's a very conceptual artist, because he pushed the boundaries with the medium of photography. But he's, of course, also a very uh, political, critical, and social uh, photographer, which is perhaps something that we have most in memory when we think about Boris Mikhailov, because he is very much known internationally once he did this very famous series of case history, we'll see later, showing homeless people. This pushed him from one night to the other to the international scene on the first uh, stage. So it would be reduced to go only to Boris Mikhailov and say he's only into these trashy things, which made, of course, move a lot of uh, critics and speak about him to classify him. So we wanted also to show the very romantic, the very beautiful uh, Boris Mikhailov. But still, yesterday's sandwich, I don't know if you have seen this already, takes some time. Uh, we will not go together inside. You can also do it perhaps afterwards. It's a very beautiful uh, series that he did at the beginning of his creation in Kharkiv, which means with his friends, because he always worked mostly at the beginning in group with other artists uh, like Malovane, like Pavlov, like Bratkov, like Piatkovka, who is present here today also, and other artists, because he always thought first it's funnier to be together and to work together, and also we advance better and quicker in history of art if you make a kind of manifest. So the manifest which made him perhaps move to make art 
was the Blue Horses, which is not really an artistic um, movement of fine art, but more of music and behavior, which was in the 60s. And five years later, he started himself doing photography, of course, in these photo clubs that might you know of history of the USSR, uh, where he made these nude uh, pictures, which made him lose his job. I always say nudity made him lose his job. And nudity will be all over the series. On each floor you will always see nudity. This, of course, was highly forbidden. He already pushed the boundaries at the beginning by showing nudity. But what made him special? It's by adding on black and white pictures colors that we have it here. Introducing color as a, a strong uh, political message also that we will see afterwards in the series called Red. And in the third floor, the third gallery story about the performative part, he introduces also text. So using the boundaries of photography, uh, adding color, adding text, allowed him to get a conceptual artist like Alicia said, and allowed him to you know, push the limits of the medium of photography. And that's why I think personally, uh, the three of us are very much convinced that why he's such a great and exceptional artist. He really um, had a great uh, talent on, on this kind of invention to make a new medium out of the photography. So yesterday's sandwich, it's very simple. Yesterday's sandwich, a sandwich has two bread, like you push something over it, it's two images. Mostly he uses like uh, traditional Soviet images, and then he puts very often nudity over it. Like Sovietism and sexuality was this kind of dualism uh, that was the creation of this theory called uh, yesterday's sandwich, and which was uh, created as a slideshow because they met in Kharkiv in these artists' apartments, private but open to public, and they were having uh, vodka with uh, music from the Western countries, illegally listening to and having these projections. Only in the 80s later he made the prints that you will also see. And the way it is hanged on the wall is very much Boris Mikhailov's that because we curators first hang two pictures, one here, the other one there, and he said, no, 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 it doesn't work like this. It has to be in a Ukrainian way. I want to have them together, like this, like you will see inside. Because you have this very nice picture of the woman, beautiful picture, and then you have this very ugly and trashy picture with the male sex uh, phallus uh, on the right side, which gives, again, this sandwich and combination. That's the way he wants to have it, and that's the way he wants to show it to you, to you Ukrainians. So it's an idea of uh, this beautiful uh, little sandwich as a start, which announced already what he does, developed very much on the other floors, text and color. So perhaps with this introduction, we can go up now and start on the third floor. Absolutely. I just wanted to add that it was um, yesterday's sandwich is really manifesto mm -hmm. in the way he uh, presents or introduces the idea of equivalence. So for Boris, there's always the sense of provocation, but it's also conceptual in the sense that he says, uh, good photography is bad photography, and bad photography is good photography. So these good and bad principles are brought together, and there is, and, we're, and then you have to step back from morality, and you have to step, step back from any kind of judgment. And it's this bringing together of those two principles that are really meant to, to, be, to be connected. And that's how also we get into, into this conceptual uh, aspect of, of his, um, of his uh, practice. And you have this quote which very much reflects the forbidden image and his way to work. Like always, this can be shown, this neither, this cannot be shown, sorry. This is, I am not sure, I can show it or not. It's always like, what is forbidden, what is over the limit, what can I take? No, it's too beautiful, no, it's too harsh. It's always this kind of struggle of dualism which is very much present. So let's go up to the fourth floor where we have the Red Sea Register. You know the image of a chewing gum because he's re-chewing all the time, existing series, reinterpreting, reusing. For example, in this red series, you have Yesterday's Sandwich, you have Susie, you have Calendar, which are other series which are sometimes shown here or not. And he reuses sometimes the same images, uh, like this one, which is from Yesterday's Sandwich, for example, uh, or this one, which is from Susie. Okay, you can't see it's on the very bottom. And he creates this series where is no adding color and no adding text. Not like the one you have behind in the display, which is called acidity, which is much more performative. Here we are in real humanism, again on this topic, 
which is about the color red. You know what the red color is for, coming from a country which used to be communist, he was using this color in a different way, to use the red color in these kind of pictures, which was quite provocative because it's not the official color how to use in Soviet Union regime uh, politics or propaganda. Also the way it is hanging is very much boys, because I think even during the press conference he still changed some pictures. <laughs> Sometimes he just interrupted the filming and he came and changed again. It's an eternal process like the one of the quote you've seen downstairs. Do you want to add Yeah, this just this idea again of the, of the ongoing image that you, that you underline. And that's really where we understand that it's about concept, that we're not, it's not about photography, even though the frames are very important, the size and the way also Boris works with space. And again, uh, everything is so precise in, in the way he, you know, he chooses the scale of the images, and sometimes he likes one image is very small and then very big, and then it's something that is that is definitely a very very precise. So maybe we can move. Let's go to the next gallery, which is the series called At Dusk, which is red series, blue series, and then brown series. They have a certain link together. So we start with reality downstairs with salt lake with Lurik in soft art. We, we go to yesterday's sandwich, which is again those two layers of reality that are brought together and, and color that is kind of there to also turn reality into something else. Then we go back to reality with red and of course Soviet reality with red and red being, being this very, uh, very strong political color. That's and then he takes us, and that's where he takes us to conceptualism again. In something in, in two series that are very very uh, romantic and that are also very conceptual and it's again this ongoing landscape of Kharkiv of the harshness of Kharkiv that is turned into some a place of nostalgia it's a place for longing blue being this color of melancholy um, and here the again the the way the, the, it is displayed, we are really into something that is a big, big images, something that is very constructed, that is turned into a small line of images, and almost into something that has appears in the space. Um, and from that blue, we, we, we get to the brown series, which is also a line of photography, very delicate, again, very, very, uh, almost unnoticed. And then you're kind of thrown into something that is almost taking you away from reality. So again, all these layers of the reality, of escapism, of getting into reality, getting more, and then pushing you away from it, this is something that is either, like yesterday's sandwich, brought together in a single room, or in the journey and the flow of the, the exhibition, taking, taking, you, uh, well, taking you from one room to another. But you will always feel this tension, and those things really exist together. So you cannot really stop from one gallery to another. And that's also what you explained about the idea of using images again and again. And you will maybe see the same images that are treated in a different way from one gallery to another. But you understand that it is an ongoing journey in through the image, through Kharkiv, through Soviet times and the collapse of Soviet times, through Soviet times and the idea of protest and provocation within Soviet times and how to challenge reality in when you are in such a repressive context, but also when you uh, when this concept context is collapsing and when you have to recover from that reality and change your own reality. So each time Boris is taking you in this uh, in this very very tense, in this very contradiction and contradictory journey. I will add some remarks in the next gallery because they are working together. So we had red, we had blue, and this is the brown series, which is called By the Ground. The blue series, by the way, is called At the Dusk. And just some additional marks about the blue series, which is in fact a very harsh, a very cruel series, because if you look at the details, you will see all this uh, 
poverty, uh, which is... Uh, the collapse of Soviet Union. Exactly. Uh, Perestroika, Glasnost is starting, the huge uh, apparatchnik of uh, Soviet Union is falling down, and the promising new Western mode of life is not really happening. So, in fact, it was even worse. It was even more poverty. I know, perhaps you know that from your parents at that time. And this is something for him which was the most difficult period in his life. And he also had a lot of nightmares. And he had nightmares about when he was a child, the souvenirs of the Second World War, of the bombing. And he explained to me that he, this is playing and adding in this At the Dusk series. Those and, are very had, and the same harshness in this Brown series. So now comes in plus of this, because now you have the impression it's documentary photo right now. Boris goes further on. He's not doing documentation. The way he's photographing this Brown series was to take a picture not like a photograph would do. He had the camera on his, I uh, call this, Solange, and he made pictures only from that side. That's why we, okay, we wanted to show it at the beginning by the ground, but it should be shown, in fact, at the height of your branch. And he took pictures like this by walking through the town, by the walking through Kharkiv. And this gives us the link to this video that we have here, because he made a commission to an artist in Paris, who is called David Tebul, who made specifically for us two major films, which are showing um, the life of Boris, because he accompanied him eight years ago for a commission of a film documentary in the Arte TV channel. And he has 40 hours of rush. And uh, we told him, please, we want to have Boris also with his voice. We want to see him, how he's moving, how he's working. And he made these specific commissions. One is coming later, we're speaking about it. But this one, going with Brown at, at dusk, shows Boris Mikhailov walking from the station to his house by filming him only from behind, from his back. Also another way of how to film something which is more conceptual than the idea of Boris. And he walked through the town of Kharkiv to the market and he's commenting um, his hometown, which is at that time Kharkiv and later Berlin. As you know, he lives in the two, the two uh, towns, which is also reflecting on this wall on, on your behind, which is from another series which is called Look at Me, I Look at Water, which is a series that we are showing just with single images all over the galleries like a leitmotif. And in this series here you have two homeless people, one in Kharkiv and one in Berlin. Yeah, just to add a few words on, on By the Brown, on how important it is, and that you, Martin described this idea of taking pictures from this, you know, this almost coming from the body. Uh, and it, it reminds me of something that Boris says, that he acts as a photographer, as a bastard dog. That he is almost taking, you know, the viewpoint of a wandering dog. And there is also a very interesting quote that you have to notice about as about where he compares the idea of human beings and dogs, and also this, which goes with the problem of precarity and the problem of you know people wandering in the streets and people becoming almost an animal life, which is also very tragic. But there is something that is very strong in this um, in this position of the bastard dog as photographer that he enhances. And again, here we have the the idea of the walking. And the idea also of, of collective thinking that uh, that we mentioned about the Harki, uh, also the Harki context and the idea of the slideshow exhibitions that were made like yesterday sandwich also because of censorship because each time you have to go back to those years where doing photography just doing just having a creative practice was something that was not admitted and especially in Kharkiv, which is a city of engineers, of the making of intelligentsia, and the idea of being creative is not really allowed. So for me, by, by the round speaks about also this collective uh, activity of walking. And there is a very interesting quote also, when we will see their invisible links, and that's also why, why we're, we, we try to, to show you those links, because you cannot always know, see them. But upstairs in the fifth floor in the Kharkiv School uh, Photography uh, Exhibition, there is um, a picture of, of Boris that we will see, taken by Kochetov, where he speaks about those walks that he would do with Boris. And it would, they would speak about images, but they would also just walk and, and not to see anything special, but then many, many pictures from that series were taken along those walks that they would make together and speaking about photography, just walking around. 
and that's also how how Buddhist works. And again, here, they're really those series are very strong because they gather all those different aspects that we, we stress in the show, which is the idea of the real, the idea of romanticism, the idea of the performative. Um, all these layers are, are, are brought together in that series. Um, and, um, and it takes us to this, of course, this landmark um, series of case history. And we're very, very happy to be able to experience it in different scales with like an over kind of overwhelming immersive installation of images. Yeah, you mentioned it. Case history. We are now in this uh, big gallery, which is I think the perfect space to show this very important series, which at the same time is one of the most difficult series, also for boys, because it is so famous and also because it is so harsh, so cruel and so uh, real, but it goes much, much further. So first we have, um, I think there are about 400 pictures originally about this series, so we have a selection out of it, and of course I think Still, he would change if he's still in. I mean, he's still in, Kork, uh, in Kiev. Perhaps he will change by tomorrow. But <laughs> he was really changing here all the time. They're hanging because it looks like random like, but it's not at all random like. For him, it's really very important. Each picture has to stay in a certain way, in a certain conversation. He was not that happy about the quote which is behind us. Uh, as you can None see. of the quotes. He told me this morning. It's so bad. We have to take them all out. <laughs> Which was not the case the day before, but that's typically Boris like processing and continuing and uh, you can read a man falls, there is a dog by his side. Who is the dog? Who is the man? He was frightened that, uh, you know, this could be too evident for this very strong series of case history uh, that we can consider these humans like the dogs and other way around, but the fact is these are homeless people. And, you know, it's not like boys would take his limousine and uh, go to the suburbs, pay the taxi chauffeur, and then speak to these guys and hey, I want to take your pictures. It's, I think, much more that himself he was in a certain mood and uh, state which allowed him to get in contact with his people. Perhaps he met them by chance, and from uh, this came out this um, meeting and dialogue and conversation. And of course, there was an exchange because what you see here is mostly staged. He made really kind of compositions. And that's where, again, we have this kind of genius, as he is, because you have these very, very big, huge scale paintings, photos, sorry, here, but I say paintings because it's very classical. He has a very classical approach of how to photograph them. If you take in consideration classical paintings, 18th century, Pantou de Jean, Pantou de Porte, it's exactly the same way he does, and especially in religious paintings. We can see some of Richard's iconography in these very, very nice homeless people, like using them like religious saint people, which gives, I think, personally, a strength to these very strong and harsh pictures of homeless people. Yeah, and, and again, I think here, but um, when, when thinking about exhibiting the series in Ukraine, there was something about showing it in a very raw way. And, and also, I think all those little, little images that are in dialogue with the biggest, uh, the biggest scale um, the photographs. And we are definitely here. Boris is become is, is a is classical artist, and he's really turning photography into going back to class to high art. And even I wouldn't say genre painting. Actually, I would say. Histor history, <coughs> and the history. title yeah. and the title of the series is case history, and here from this very uh, local, it, 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 it's it's multi 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 layered. You have this idea of going back of, of starting from those invisible people, those people that are outcast, that are not to be seen, that are are meant to be hidden in our society, and especially in the West. And that's actually interesting that it is the series that allowed him to be part of the Western discourse because those images in the West is something that you cannot admit as something that is part of your society. So here he's taking those invisible people he, and he's turning them into the heroes. That's also how, I mean, how the complexity of his work, uh, in 
how it's, it's located. It's this uh, idea of instead of using invisible people to show this, uh, or, or, or uh, you know, and, and to kind of uh, show them in something that is meant to be like small and. He is using them and he's staging them as heroes, as the new heroes of our time. And he's empowering them also. So it's, it's really not this kind of uh, uh, mis this portrait of misery or, or this idea of taking them out of their... They are outcasts and they need, to, they need to find their position also. And maybe they can embody something about the future of society to be to change, to challenge also maybe the Western model that is now replacing the Soviet Soviet time model. So it's, it's a very deep, deep uh, reflection on on how society changes and, and representation within society. Um, and we're really in the forbidden image. We are here facing the series that is the most yeah. radical in terms of images that you are not even allowed to see. That's why he didn't want to show it at the beginning. Initially he said, we will do a show without case history. Like, listen, no. We can't do a Boris Mikhailov show without case history. I mean, people want to see this. By the way, this is not what we want to see, this is not what we like, but this is what the artist wants to show you because it has to punch you, it has to shake you, it has to really react to you. It's a political also. statement. And I want to say something also from a historical point of view, going back very shortly to 19th century painting. As you might perhaps know, uh, after the Baroque painting came the neoclassical painting, which is a very natural, realistic way of hero, heroical, uh, historical painting, and it's painting as precise as possible. And then, 19th century, photography was invented, technically invented, possible to take pictures by the middle of 19th century on. And from this same moment, abstractism abstract painting was born, of course, first in a slight way of realism and of impressionism, because impressionism is nothing else than a reaction to this very precise, natural, realistic painting, because there was no need anymore. We have now photography doing its job, and we can artistically evaluate. And Boris is the same with the medium of photography. He's not using photography to make like beautiful, nice pictures, like it was the case for the Soviet propaganda. We have to show the strength, the beauty of the power of men and the women with the babies and so on and the agriculture. It's not this use of photography anymore, and I think of course. Uh, he's pushing again this boundary and he evaluates very much the medium of photography and it's even much more genius because he does this in a close country of Ukraine which was not open to the world. And he had all this modern thing in his head. And I think it's because of the boundaries, because of the censorship, and because of these borders which were imposing him to react like this. And that's why he's a real genius, because it's much easier to do this, to do this like other big artists, which I don't want to name it because it's too evident to make comparisons, but they were free. They could do and show naked, it was of no provocation, as you said before. But Boris did really dangerous things. Dangerous things, and I don't think he was thinking at the beginning that he was an artist. And we also always wanted to know, Boris, when did you get when did you start it? When did you have the awareness that you are an artist, that you are doing not photography but conceptual art? And it's something I think which came really like in a natural process, thanks to these boundaries I was just trying to explain to you. Next room we don't stop, because it's again a film of two hours. You can then stay there and have a rest uh, about David Teboul, again this uh, French uh, artist. And he shows the complete series of Boris, because we do not show all of them, like we have a lot of series showing, like also chronotic, chronologically, but not in the same order. And there you can have the complete complement of the series which are missing, hearing Boris telling his personal stories about each series. So let's go now directly. The way he deals with images, which is very, very precious. So I really encourage you, when, when you have some time, just to come in and, and listen 20 minutes, 30 minutes, because it's, it's so precious to understand how he relates to images. Because you cannot really, you can feel it, but you cannot really feel it unless you hear him. Because the way he speaks about the images, being, being very conceptual, is very important. The, the, the wording and, and the way he explains the, those in, the principle of equivalence, of contradiction that is always at stake in his images. So it's a very precious. Uh, we're actually very happy that this yes. show allowed uh, allowed the, the making and the commissioning of this new document, which.
which will be so precious for the future uh, to understand when, when voice is gone, also to understand how he relates to those images. Because it will be a challenge uh, to make a show uh, of voice without him, because it's also an internal process to feel the images. So I really, I stress the, the idea of him spending time with that also reflecting on the position of women at that time, uh, not being officially um, artists, but uh, rather the, the wives of the artists or whatever. And you see, we'll have, a, we'll have another issue with that uh, upstairs in the kind of school of photography and other uh, couple situations. But it's for us, it was really a statement to think and to reflect upon the role played by Lupita in the process. So we are in those three rooms that we're entering now, bringing them together. Is it not only romantic, 
Uh, he, I was this, I was starting saying that he was seeking on in an ongoing way about provoking, about finding a way to bring images that are pushed out of society. Well, today uh, I think he's he also kind of reintegrated all those images from the, this idea of nostalgia and the past, and this uh, he, the way he deals with nudity here, going back to this mythological um, series and scenes. It's something also that now society today kind of neglects, you know, it's like those romantic images are not meant to be part of our reality because now our reality is about, you know, like those overwhelming nudity. So he's bringing, he's bringing back, he's seeking a way to deal with nudity that is again kind of pushed out from, from, uh, from our daily lives. So going back to nostalgia is also a statement that is part of his reflection on provocation. So in that respect, it's also very important to, to underline. And the romanticism about Vita, of course, the muse, um, this relationship to landscape also that is kind of sketched here, uh, not only in the politique, that is again a homage to painting, we're really like in this, uh, in this class, purely classical, uh, classical art uh, way of, of dealing with photography that is turned into mm. classical painting, but also in the small table that you will see there where you have a very intimate series of Vita uh, naked uh, in Crimea uh, that really becomes the landscape. So there is really something about um, a reflection on, on, on nature, on body and nature, on the idea also of refounding the origins of of the world, and in that respect, it's very romantic. But again, it it, it has a dialogue with more provocative images of, of Vita taken by Boris as Eve, that is of course committing the original sin. Uh, so it's this is kind of the positive aspect of it. But there are also images in in the practice of Boris that dialogue secretly with those pictures about also um, women being the temptation, being the sinner. Uh, and being maybe also the redemptor like here. So all these things are, are brought together. And about this little, little image that you could see in between the two galleries, again, for us, it was a statement because it's a, it's a picture where you see Vita, who is pregnant with Boris. Uh, and it's a way for us to kind of totally um, reverse and, and, and this, this image of Boris being you know, the artist, the photographer, and the, and the little muse that is kind of used as an image in the pictures. We really kind of, we wanted to pay tribute to Vita and to show how, how also uh, she kind of pushed Boris and she also was at the origin and at the beginning of many, many series of many, many works. Uh, we wanted to challenge this, this notion of authorship. And finish this Boris Mikhailov show in a more intimate well, tribute to, to Vita. Because now we can go upstairs to the fifth and last floor, which is the second show called Crossing Lines, where we can speak about Kharkiv School of Photography. And actually it was a very important transition for us because you will see that in the Kharkiv School of Photography, uh, there is something, there are many, of course, um, overlaps between Boris practice and uh, the other uh, artists and photographers from Kharkiv also who were friends and sometimes it was collective processes. But there is something in Kharkiv that he is long looking for um, turning photography into art, into something that is beautiful, that is not always at stake with Boris. Uh, but I think this room kind of leads us naturally to this reflection. And you can see that it is still embedded in Boris practice, even though we always have this contradiction that you don't always find in the Kharkiv School of Photography. So Bakhtanyan makes, draws a portrait of the city of Kharkiv. Um, it's a way for us to kind of introduce you and propel you into the city, um, which is a very, very special place.
Welcome to this uh, second exhibition, Crossing Lines, uh, Kharkiv School of Photography, which of course is not to take in a first lecture way. There's not really specifically a Kharkiv School of Photography existing, but the way they work together is like uh, this whole style and school that we would say in a, in a, in a way uh, describes this creation of these different artists that we are showing on that floor three generations, like the first generation that really were close with Boris working together, as I told in the beginning, they often worked in groups. The second generation, which is also visible here, and we are mixing them together because they're working on themes. And then we also had this uh, last generation of young Ukrainian artists, uh, four artists we, are, we were inviting to, to react on this Kharkiv school, coming also from Kharkiv mainly that we mixed up together in this, in this show. Having this first gallery here as a kind of context about a historical point, what is Kharkiv? Like most of you might know, a very industrial town with a lot of engineers, where all the intelligentsia was living, where, by the way, uh, Kharkov was famous for the producing of the FET brand camera, which was very much used also by these artists of photographs at that time, uh, which made this town very special. And it was not by chance that from Kharkiv was born this kind of Kharkiv school that we have here. Perhaps about um, the different artists here in that gallery? Yeah, so again, uh, we, uh, being outsiders, it, the, the idea of the school of photography that uh, Bratko from the lines and in the introductory quotes um, is it, the school of photography is n well known for. Uh, different for introducing different new steps into the medium of photography, uh, technical steps, and that's really something that is present. That but we are really stepping back from this historical narrative. It's again kind of also kind of a personal statement on on the school and on on those years and Kharkiv, and it's really meant to be kind of a portrait of the city because what we understood from uh, spending time there and, and meeting artists and discovering the works is there is something about um, a feeling of the city. And, and, and that's really what we wanted to, to offer, is to offer also this wandering from uh, Kharkov, who used to be the capital, uh, who is this very harsh city, uh, where reality is very difficult, I mean, is also very strong, very harsh. There is a sense of, you know, kind of striving, struggling against, uh, against uh, um, you know, symbols of power and all these things. There is something about the loneliness, there is something about solitude, and there is something about how to challenge that reality, how to escape it. Um, and that's all these strategies that we try to frame in the show. So the idea of looking at reality as it is, and in its harshness, in its mad madness, and that's something that we will see in the next room. And there is something about how to address that reality, how to change it through the medium of photography. And how did they do it? They did it with the idea of private performances uh, and, and, and challenging again and introducing nudity in images, which was again a big, big provocation. Uh, it was uh, about uh, organizing those private uh, apartment exhibitions, slideshow exhibitions. Uh, and we have, and we get a sense of that in, in the little side room that you see there. Um, it was about uh, also longing for beauty, longing for photography as an artistic medium, and longing for nature, longing for the past. There is a sense of nostalgia that is even even more present than in Boris's uh, work. Um, and that's this whole flow, this whole journey that we wanted to to offer throughout the show. And these first rooms are really kind of contextualizing, um, I mean, historically, but also this feeling of the city where you can feel that um, there was a sense of playing with the symbols of the city, with this hand colored photography, and the school is very well known for these things. Uh, this is kind of a wallpaper that we made out of a, uh, of a series of Yevgeny Pavlov here, where, of course, the symbol of power is turned into this kind of hand colored image. image something that you can play with, hinting at also the, the context of avant-garde, which was, of course, uh, how the artist came from that context, this idea of photomontage that is at stake in the work of Supun, for example, which is one of the first artists of 
the school um, and moving on to hand coloring, a slideshow exhibitions that you see there, this idea of nudity, this idea also of agency within the city, which is present in the Rubin images that you see there. This woman is, is this kind of very free expression, free um, staging herself, you know, as someone who can really move the borders of the city, move how, move and, and be free in the city, which is, which is, of course, a way to cross lines. And that's this idea of provocation that we wanted to stress throughout the show. But two pieces here, the one she mentioned is this slideshow in the other little room that you have to go later and see to it, it's from Pavlov and it's called Orochrome, from which also this huge wallpaper was um, taken, or the one of his wife, Tatiana, that you have also a kind of crossing line that you have on this wall up there, which were these shows they did in their apartments with their friends, with their artists. But also in a second generation way, Roman Piatkovka, which is this polyptych of six photographs that you have on that wall here, which shows again this nudity, which was such a provocative um, way to protest uh, the situation of the of the time at the uh, Soviet Union and to make it inside the apartment, but by projecting all these official buildings, like the very famous Gosprom, that is uh, one of the most famous uh, Soviet Union buildings, which is in all uh, books about architecture, that Piatkovka also made project on this naked body that you have in this beautiful series uh, on, on that wall there. And at the same time, you have a series which is completely hidden here on that red wall, which will lead us now to the next room by Misha Pedan, photographing um, the metro. But not, for example, like uh, Boris Mikhailov did with the By the Ground. Here, much more in a very direct facing way, uh, showing the day life of this harshness that you can feel through these very true and uh, uh, intimate pictures of passengers using the metro in Kharkiv. Yeah, it's really this relationship between individuals and the city that we wanted to, to show here. This idea of performing the city in Piatkovska series, or the, this idea of the metro that, we, that is following us from one room to another, to give you a sense also of this flow, of also um, the difficulty to just to move, to circulate uh, yeah. in the city. Because there's an, an, a quote of Misha Bedar that describes that it took him 45 minutes to go to the city and back. So it's an hour and a half per day that it took him, I don't know, a thousand, uh, he has a thousand pictures or he spent a thousand hours in the metro. So it's about also this sense of timing, of, of understanding and feeling the city in your own body. And that's also how we uh, started to, we started the journey with this idea of taking you, it's, it's a conceptual, it's mm. definitely a conceptual uh, thread for us from one room to another to, to help ahead. you feel the city. We wanted to show the theme of madness that you have in certain uh, art pieces here present. Very loud. That you can hear. And to have the contrast. Uh, for example, I take this example of uh, Pavlov in this table, which are a series of a hospital called Psychosis, as he was working there himself. And take this very cruel, awful, harsh pictures of patients, of illness, of uh, mad people, uh, contrasting it with a very um, crazy way to photograph by Roman Piatkovka of the witches that he's calling the series in his apartment again, jumping along, which gives this nice dialogue of this madness aspect. And this very iconic picture behind me of Solonsky and Bratkov uh, called Brave Kharkiv Lions, showing themselves all nude like lions, but at the same time they're all uh, mute and um, weak, uh, looking at this very contrary metro series of Misha Pedan that you have behind, which gives this kind of very different way of how to show uh, just um, this kind of uh, picture of documenting down to a very conceptual, performative way. We added to this uh, madness a very strong series of Sergei Bratkov, which are these portraits of children. Why are they uh, so strong? Because what we have here are the glue sniffers. These are all um, drug-addicted children in the institute where he made this very personal beautiful portrait of each child, which of course doesn't have a very normal life and circumstances, which is in the same time feeling through this 
poetry as is doubling it. You know, it's several times of several layers. But you can say more about that. Yeah, so again here it's really to propel you into this climate of the city, which is a city uh, where, you know, there's something about this madness, about this harshness, about being trapped in a reality that you cannot really escape. And that's what the provocation lies. That's why the, the photographers of the Harkin School of Photography were so important. They tried to, to challenge that reality. So for us it was very important to frame it, for you to feel it. And that's also why we included a gesture like this picture of um, of um, Mitasov, who all Mitasov was kind of a poet uh, and spent a lot of time in his apartment and was also covering the walls with all these writings. It's like about this inner obsession about uh, notions of addiction, uh, as Marta said, uh, and, 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 and how to, how to, so we start from that reality that is kind of where you're stuck and how can you challenge it? And again, with the nudity, with the performances, but this is this room is meant to propel you into that harshness. Um, maybe we can go to the mythology. So in the big room, you had this, you got a sense of um, how how the photographers tries to try to challenge the reality, looking at it with a very with, with even if, even when it's very cruel, like the psychosis. Or, um, or trying to challenge it with nudity and private performances. And that's where we are. We're really into this, again, this idea of private performance, where the artist, which is now Yevgeny Pavlov, uh, together with his, so with his family and together with also with Boris Mikhailov, who is also shown here as a performer, how they try to escape from that reality, challenge it, and go back to maybe something that is even further more uh, about escapism because it's back to this idea of uh, a history of art, turning performance into tableau vivant, uh, going back to mythologies, mythological scenes. And you can see here um, the different scenes that maybe Martin can, can, uh, yes. uh, can explain further. We have mythology scenes which are represented here in this performative way that you can start there with uh, Cupidon and Venus, in the first four pictures we have Pygmalion is the second one coming, following. Behind me we have Demeter. Uh, we have here uh, Judith and Holofernes. <coughs> and we have Laocon in the last uh, series, like the very famous statue that you can notice and recognize Boris Mikhailov himself. So this is also about a family thing, about uh, working together, like having fun on a weekend, going out for a picnic, like in the last picture that you have there and doing then uh, this forbidden way of naked uh, interpretations of photography, which is a collective work. Uh, Pavlov and, uh, and uh, Mikhailov were very close uh, friends. They worked a lot together. They were very much influenced together. And that's why I think this series is a very strong series. I personally like it very much because it's very intimate and it's also uh, very strong because you can feel that there's a bit of reflection behind. And I want to point on something in particular because you have Tetiana Pavlova, the wife of Evgeny, uh, that has her head bald. Uh, we will see this in the later room, also later in the last gallery. There's, she has a bit of hair again here, which of course was a very, very radical act. No one at that time was shaving the head. Uh, the women had long hair, or you, you were not balding it like she did. This of course was also a kind of a very provocative act. Uh, that is uh, visible in, in this in this series here. Yeah, the series and this room is really a tribute to the role that uh, Boris Mihailov played also within the School of Photography, being himself a character, being a performer, as you can see here, but also in, in this other triptych there. By um, Solonsky. By Solonsky. And again, as just, just as I, I mentioned about Vita and Boris, the role we wanted to stress and acknowledge the role of Tetiana Pavlova within uh, within the work of Yevgeny Pavlov, because this is one of the rare series where you can see mm. also uh, Tetiana Pavlova in empowered roles, so in, in role playing the role of very strong woman through mm. that go back to history and, and mythology. Uh, but for us, it's also, it was also very important in that respect to understand the role played by those women who were really this very strong woman. Mm -hmm. um, and how, how they could challenge also the narrative 
of like all these artists that were men. Um, so you have, by uh, the way, a lot of quotes by Pavlova, by Tatiana Pavlova on the walls, as she was still nowadays writing about uh, yes. this Kharkiv school, which for us is also a very important person to be present. She's present through the pictures, she's present through the text, mm. and we also wanted to figure on a certain way the role of women in that time, because to be honest, officially we already have these male, uh, sorry, these um, uh, yes, male artists uh, of the Kharkiv school, of the first generation and second generation, which... Uh, Even in younger artists, we only have one woman. So for us, it was very, very important. Alina Kleitman. But this room is also about creating meat, yeah. meat it's, which is very important for us. With, with this um, Kharkiv school, uh, they created myth, they created new things. And this is also that when we wanted to have this mythology, uh, in the first lecture way, uh, gallery to have this idea of creating myth, which is nicely shown, sorry, on this small uh, photo on the wall, which is also by Pavlov, where you can see, uh, by the way, Boris Mikhailov. It's a montage, and it's a creation of, like in Kharkiv, of, of myth. We, we had uh, this uh, association with uh, creating myth uh, in, in of this uh, school of artists. Perhaps you go further to the nudity room directly. You might know her, she's living now in Kiev. The video is called Nails. And Alina, you might know her because she has won the special jury prize three years ago in the Pinterest Art Center prize that was uh, given for the second year. And uh, you have this uh, voice of this man trying to get into this room where Alina is playing with her nails and decorating and giving this kind of madness which is driven by envy, by lust, by sexuality. And it never happens until you act. But uh, I think it's very strong with this uh, voice that you have in front of, that you have behind all over this, this gallery. And it's sometimes dialoguing with this Sasha Kurmans video that you have here which is a very modern way, close to Boris Mikhailov, to show this harshness of real humanism, like nowadays, because taken out of webcams of YouTube, mixed together and created by this kind of way. Very interesting, very interesting video of this that I really suggest to more longer than we can do now. themes of uh, performative nude that we have very nicely presented in this very intimate room because we have here mainly male nudes showing all the people be gay uh, as it is shown very nicely in a poetic way by Oleg Malovane that you have in the, in the triptych only the three pictures behind you and also on that wall there where you can very much see the performative part of this uh, uh, with Georgi that is represented on the pictures by Malovane, responding to this very main burial uh, sound of the Malovane, which is a beautiful series, and uh, which is in fact quite uh, confrontating by what you can see here by Roman Kafka, which is a huge wallpaper. We prefer to show it in a big way instead of the originals, because it gives a certain strength of this very androgynous, uh, of course, gay, inside again, uh, Apartments, introducing again what we have learned about Boris Mikhailov of the heritage, with introducing text uh, on the image itself. And finally, also behind you, Sergei Menchenko, who is this young artist showing these young guys from the province of Ukraine aiming for this idea, which is Arnold Schwarzenegger, the bodybuilder, their way to get this very strong and viral product they have it here in the sauna. But at the same time, when you look at it, 
it's a very um, elegant, a very soft way because his body movements are like dancing. It gives a very, again, androgynous uh, way of representing these male figures. And for this political act, we added Ridley, Nicolai Ridley, this young artist, showing here the boots that he made uh, fabric, that you have uh, the film of this uh, stone mason that made these soldier, soldier shoes, of the soldier army shoes, uh, which also is, of course, evocating the more political aspect of, uh, of this room that can have nudity. So it's really a room that is also responding in a way to I am not I that we just saw before. It's this idea of challenging the representation of the male body. And uh, here all the, all, all the men are either taken with this daily activity of sauna or in the performative aspect. They are becoming almost uh, choreographers. They are becoming dancers. It's, playing, it's really turning upside down the symbols of power. And facing that you have this kind of an expect this like, notion of what is expected from a man, the idea of the power. And this tension that we wanted to bring together is also kind of resonating with, with Boris' practices, with Boris's practice. And uh, and this is an excerpt of the anti, it's called anti-hero, I think the Roman Petrovka, that is also leading us to the next room, and which is a very, I think, very strong room, and about also capturing a moment, which is, you know, in the 70s, the youth culture, punk and hippie culture that we're also uh, starting, and um, just youth gathering together, having fun, and, and pushing the boundaries of what was allowed and not allowed. So um, it's also for us a transition to, to the next room. And of course, speaking about minorities, which were always, uh, uh, minorities were never respected on how harder life than we can know it nowadays. And another minority is the hippies you will see next to my father. This is called by First, for the historical aspect of this really beautiful series of Pablo, I like to say it in a subjective way, but uh, it's a very strong and beautiful series by Ekeli Pablo. He made this series during two weekends. Um, he was with the hippie community, as it was also kind of forbidden, and they went to the forest, they took the train, they went to this landscape where they had this river and this beautiful clarion, and they were doing uh, music with the instrument. The idea was the beginning to have an accordion, finally they had this violin, and they made during two weekends this series of naked people, which again was, uh, of course, forbidden at that time. And Some of them were caught. Yes, exactly. And also uh, the very uh, strong moment of, which is not represented at the end of the two week weekends, they burned the violin, uh, which is not representing here in, in the scene. But the violin is a kind of light motif that goes through that ser series, uh, showing again that uh, nudity was this big problem. And by the way, this was never shown to public. They tried to show it in exhibition in 84. In 1984, it only stayed for one day. They had to close it down because of the officials. They would not allow this. They feel it a very big provocation of nudity, of freedom, of these hippies, uh, which of course was completely contrary to the time of the, of the Union, of the Soviet Union. So we have shown it much more in a romantic way, in a personal romantic, even if you have a very strong performative way of uh, uh, due to the power. The beginning of the starting point. Thank you. Yeah, because uh, I think it's a series that is that is known by specific images because some of them are very lyrical, they're very romantic. But I think that we wanted here to also to emerge people into this performance and it's into this kind of ongoing, almost cinematic, also uh, aspect of, of the performance and to show the well the provocation that was at stake in such a series. Because if you could just see this image with the violin, you just think, oh, this is a beautiful image. It's about you know romanticism and lyricism and all that. But it was actually a series that was one of mm. the most provocative mm. at the time, with this overwhelming main nudity, with this idea of also yeah hippie culture and, and all the things that we've been. Um, but there's of course something romantic in the melancholy, and I think this last image in that respect, which is alone on that wall, that was also very a choice that we made very precisely. 
speaks about this, this melancholy and that leads us to the last room, which is really a room dedicated to solitude, loneliness, uh, which is definitely part of this feeling of living in Kharkiv and what the photographers kind of translated in an ongoing way. Of the two shows of a written image, like on the Voice Behind Us show, we come now to a more intimate uh, ending. Uh, it was with Vita, and here we are with Solitude. And uh, it was a nice way for us to say, to finish this, this exhibition, as again we have the three themes which are present in this, in this gallery here of the personal romantics, of new and performative, but also of um, the new um, realism that we have. That we have here with the cherry gardens showing the end of this, of this Soviet Union system. But first, solitude, we have this very beautiful work of uh, Sergei Bratkov, uh, which, is century, a new which is a new work. Century of Solitude. Century of Solitude with the neon light. Uh, showing about these different uh, works that we have here of Aldo Bratkov in the series Confronted to This World, Home Alone, where he is doing this kind of performance, again in closed apartments. And on the other wall, we have a young artist called Sergei Menichenko, where you can see uh, nails in chats of these uh, sexual chats, like nowadays it is so much a market and the industry out of it, and at the same time may, gives us more and more of solitude, like this cyber solitude. And he was taking these um, screenshots uh, by logging in in different chats and anonymously taking these pictures of men that you cannot recognize, of course, but confronting them to the trees that you have working in a in a diptych, you have the man and you have the tree which is working together, which is again, I think, nicely corresponding and responding to the work of Bratko with the cherry gardens that we have here. Yeah, so um, again, the idea was to end in this uh, relationship between the city of Kharkiv, between this intimacy. Uh, and, and it was also a statement for us to, to understand the school of photography as this means also to assert photography as an artistic medium and as something that was dealing with nature, that was dealing with also romanticism. Um, and in that respect, those are very, very intimate works and they speak about, about this, this very, this etadab, this kind of inner solitude that is also conveyed even by this dialogue between the body and the city, between those disappointments, of course, of history, uh, but also daily life, um, and it's it's really meant to be kind of a very a very intimate uh, room, and I, I hope you also engage in, in that in, in that just uh, that intimacy and that uh, very personal because um, you know all those works are very small. It's really meant to bring you back into your own, also your own kind of inner. Uh, inner state in, in, in your own fantasy, in your own perception of, you know, we started with the big city of Kharkiv and we end up with this kind of very individual uh, and intimate uh, landscape, inner landscape, which is inside you. And in that respect, there's just one series that we haven't mentioned, which is, again, uh, this very intimate uh, play, interplay of, um, of uh, Yevgeny Pavlov and, and, and Tatiana Pavlova, and this, it's a family performance again, but maybe even more intimate because we're inside the apartment, and they're also playing tableau vivant, they're also playing scenes, but in a way it doesn't really matter. It's really about you know this this intimacy and how how also um, this private space of the apartment allowed them in a, in this family also frame, which was also something that they had. They could not really escape that because at the time in Kharkiv it was not possible to be publicly artists or to be publicly. So again, there was always the political statement behind it. But it was really their space of freedom. Even though it's as small as this, as this room or as small as this photograph, it's really a space for freedom. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have questions, of course, we are here to... We are all bothered that you will come again back to this exhibition because I think with the educational program, we try to bring these artists regularly for the next six months to come to speak like we did in a curatorial way. But I think it's interesting to come 
again and see different aspects on different moments. So we really have a program with the artists because most of them are still living, coming to uh, Pintergard Center and explaining also with their works, their work. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.